the, the recording of the message, continuation of the last Sunday. Well, last Sunday we talked about uh, Psalm 130, uh, sorry, 37, um, and uh, we uh, followed that pattern that we, uh, we, we like. You know, you pray and God answers, you expect things happen, and it's great. Well, uh, and, and, and I called it, well, wisdom the way I like it. I mean, we all like it that way, right? So you pray, you're in need, you pray, God answers, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Well, there are situations where when you pray, uh, and you pray, and, and you pray, and, and there is no answer. Um, obviously, we, we have, I believe, experienced times like this. I will tell you one of my experience uh, that happened back in 2008. Uh, well, it was a bit easy to remember the year because that was the year when I had a secular job. <laughs> and everything was okay with that, except the point that uh, came a moment when I had to come in terms with God and said, okay, when I heard God told me, I didn't call you to Macedonia for this. And I realized that I would have to obey and just say, there were other stories, so I'm cutting the whole story short. So I went to the boss and I said, sorry, I'm leaving. And I went back to my office and I was thinking, like, thank you, God. You gave me this courage, so I did obey. I did what had to happen. I was so happy taking the step of faith again. And then the phone rang. And there goes my wife and she says, honey, I was pulling back with a car and I hit another car. <laughs> And I was like, okay, never mind, fine. Well, sometime after, phone rang again. Honey, I wrecked our car. And I was like, never mind, fine. I hang up the phone, like, okay, God, what's the message? You just told me what to do. I did it, I obeyed, and then look at this. Now I have extra costs that I didn't really plan on. So things happen like that. And we have, even in the Bible, and I'm going to continue with Psalms, but we definitely going to, we, we, we have to mention Job, kind of like it's inevitable in this context. But I want you to listen to the words of Psalm 88. It's one of those Psalms when you read it, it's like, how, how this Psalm ended up here? I mean, there is no even a word of like, thank you, God, you heard my prayer. Everything that a Psalmist is saying is like, where are you? I speak, I cry, and you don't, you don't answer. So let, let, let's go through the psalm. Just listen what the psalmist is saying. And listen to his heart and cry to the Lord. O oh Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of trouble, and my life draws near the grave. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken me from my closest friends, and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, O Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? Or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion. But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and I am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. Wow. 
It's not easy to say amen and hallelujah after these words, huh? But this is what the psalmist experienced. And he experienced it very heavily. The hand of the Lord is so heavy upon him. And he is asking the question, why? Well, we in our lives come to the point when we ask ourselves and we want to express this to God and say, why? Why is this happening to me? Well, psalmist here, as it is written, did not receive any answer. And interestingly enough, there are times when we feel that God is silent. And the psalmist argues, do you do anything in the land of the dead, in the land of the oblivion? And he knows that the promises of God are for now, for life here, because we are alive, things can happen, things can change, because God is alive. So there is nothing wrong with the theology of the psalmist, yet his experience cannot back up the theology. And we come to this point in our lives, when we know what is right, and somehow we see that things that are happening are kind of not following that. Well, as I said, we, we have to mention Job. And I believe we are well aware of the story, so we are not going to read all the 42 <laughs> chapters. But uh, chapter number one sets up the, the scene, and obviously it's like, Example of faith. Job is an example of faith. Wow. Everyone will say that. Wow. But then what happens? Happens that situation where everything turns against Job. And then we read in chapter 3 the following verses. So obviously there are the verses with the question, Why? Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Why were their knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? Why was I not hidden in the ground like a stillborn child, like an infant who never saw the light of day? Why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul? Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hatched in? Now remember what all happened to Job? All his kids and their families completely gone. All the, that he had in terms of cattle and, you know, lands and everything taken, destroyed, burned. And we are even told that when his kids would make parties, he would immediately day after do all the sacrifices to cover if the kids committed any sin against the Lord, so that everything would be correct. And he was trying to do everything in his power to live righteous life before God. And of course, now here comes this theological term, theodicy. That's that injustice. The question of justice, actually, in light of human suffering, especially of the innocent. And how can this be? Well, if we are humble, just a little bit, we will say, okay, we, were, we are not as righteous as Job. So sometimes when we suffer, we are like, okay, we know. But you know, let's be honest, I'm the first one. If I can escape that suffering? Well, his suffering was not hard enough. So here they come, the friends. And what is interesting is that, now listen to their wording. So we'll read uh, from three different speeches of the three different friends. Two verses, chapter 8, 5, and 6. Bildad said, 
But if you will look to God and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will arouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your rightful place. It's like, build that. What are you saying? Well, I guess he had no access to the chapter one <laughs> that we have. It, but it's like, uh, it just hurts to listen to his words. And then comes so far in chapter 11, again, five and six. Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sin. Thank you. Really? Don't you look at the condition that I'm in and you're telling me these words. And then comes Eliphaz in chapter 15, 5 and 6. Your sin prompts your mouth. You adopt the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, not mine. Your own lips testify against you. It's like, guys, don't you know your friend? Don't you know how he lived before God? So here you come in the moment of his hard time. And as we would say, you rub it in. Really, what a friend. Well, that was not enough. And then comes a young man called Elihu. So, interestingly, he also has to speak. And uh, this is uh, how uh, he starts his speech. Let's see. Uh, we'll read from chapter 3, 20 to 22. I must speak and find relief. I must open my lips and reply. I will show partiality to no one, nor will I flatter any man. For, I will, for if I were skilled in flattering, my maker would soon take me away. And obviously all of his... Wording is nothing new to the whole argument of the three friends, but he just does it, you know, he's young. He cannot stand that the three friends of Job were not able to find any words to condemn Job. And he's like, okay, now I will tell you how to condemn this guy. I'm going to rub it in double. <laughs> but you know what is interesting? Job doesn't have a problem with the theology. Chapter 28, verse 28. Easy to remember. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. Nothing changed when it comes to the theology of Job. When we experience grief, when we experience situations, I don't think anything changes with our theology. We just cannot find that, how that corresponds with the situation I'm in. How come I cry and I hear no answer? Because remember the, the words, some evil. Now listen to the Job chapter one, verse eight. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So what God testifies about Job, what Job says about God, perfect understanding. Yet the condition Job is in, no, this doesn't work. No, something is wrong here. Well, shall we go quickly to the New Testament? Shall we go quickly to our Lord? Where were his words on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he is quoting Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I'm not entering even theological discussions in Job. I'm not even going to enter the theological discussion here because what does that mean for Jesus, the Son of God, to tell to his Father, have, how can you forsaken me? So, like, we don't have any communication. How can God not have a communication within himself? 
So we're going to just going to drop it here. So this is the experience that Jesus had on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he felt the distance from the Father. So next time when Christians do cry, experience grief, remember that we have a Lord who experienced silence in the darkest moment. And there was no answer. But on the third day. You know, um, we, we probably heard of, if you haven't met in person, like Sembra, uh, Andrew Branson and, and his family. So Pastor Andrew Branson, back in times in Turkey, ended up in prison. And he was in prison for two years. Uh, well, that's what he can say now. When he was in prison, he had no idea that he would have been uh, two years. He probably thought like, well, I might end up here for the rest of my life. But interestingly enough, he said, in my darkest hour, in my time of need, when I was crying to God, all I heard was silence. All I heard was silence. And we ask ourselves, come on, God. Like, these are the hardest moments. This is where we would expect you to move in, to shake the earth, to open the gates, you know, so that prisoners can go out, and so on and so on. But in those moments, we, we experience God silent. But in the, on the other side, we have a testimony of the Word that we can express our feelings even when we don't like them. No one likes the moments when we are alone, hurt, broken, in darkness. But the Word of God tells us that we can say why. And God is not surprised by our whys. And He is not like, ah, they asked why, what am I going to say? No. He hears our whys. So next time when you are in a situation, remember that it's okay to ask why. Don't think it's wrong. Don't think you're insulting God. Be ready to ask why. Maybe God will answer at the same moment. I don't know. Or maybe not. In case of Job, well, God answered. But he answered with questions. And, you know, it, it's kind of like, uh, well, the Lord said, Brace yourself like a man, I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Uh, not there. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? I don't know. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Next question. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? No. What I like about the whole book of Job in this case is that Job asked questions to God. And in his mind, and let's be honest in my mind too, I think I'm right. Like I, I have a right to ask all these questions. And then comes a moment of truth. And then God starts asking questions. Uh, and the answer is like, oh, silence? How do you answer that? How do you answer where the snow comes from? I <laughs> How do you answer, like, you know, the light starts and then darkness comes and then light starts? Oh. Okay, now today we can say, like, oh, we, you know, we kind of figure out some things. Well, don't be surprised when there are more questions from God. So God, ask, God gave answer. 
Well, maybe there will be a silence. Maybe you will not hear anything for a while, regardless that while might be lasting. Or you will get an answer, completely unexpected. Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 12, that he was praying that God would remove that thing from him, and God said, no, my grace is sufficient. Oh. Completely unexpected answer. You see, God has to deal with me, God has to deal with you. Eventually, we all have to learn that we would like to live with God on our terms. And what God wants to do is that He wants us to live with Him on His terms. It wasn't easy for Pastor Andrew to be in prison for two years and not know anything. Not even know that he would be there for two years. And obviously now we talk about it after. He had no idea how long that would take. You know? We are, we are guilty. And, well, compared to Job, what can we say? But the answer that Job gets is really encouraging. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Amen. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak, I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is our response when God speaks. I repent. Regardless how I felt before that I was all right, that I had all that right to ask questions and to tell him, okay, I will ask you, now you tell me. When I hear God asking me, everything that I can produce from my side is silence. Because really, I don't know. And in all of that asking questions, listening to God and receiving counsel, it says that God was actually not happy with the three friends. And he says that they did not speak the truth of him while Job did. With all his questions and why, Job was true to God. Now, Eliko is not even mentioned. He's like, okay, kiddo, we'll deal with you later. There are still days for you to learn. <laughs> there are still days for you to experience what life really means. You know, when, when I was doing my master's and, uh, and obviously thinking that time, you know, when you're in the academic world, you think like, okay, I'm going to do a PhD and then you have all these questions. So uh, one of the things that I was told, like, when you look for somebody who is going to be your mentor, always look for an elderly man. Because, you know, those people who got a PhD and they're young, they're going to make your life miserable. But if somebody who is of age and has a PhD and can be your mentor, they will understand what this is all about, they know what is important, and they will try to be as helpful as they can. They're not going to make your life miserable. So that's a bit of a difference when there is a young person, an old person, dealing as a mentors. And when it comes to how the riches of Job were restored, it says that everything went double. Wow. But then you read that, well, he had seven sons and three daughters. And then again, he had seven sons and three daughters. Well, they didn't go 14 and 6. How come? The first seven sons and three daughters are alive to God. 
that other things can be burned, destroyed, whatever. But we are alive to God. Let's remember what even Jesus said to the Sadducees. God is God of living, of the living. Amen. So there was no need for Job to receive 14 sons and 6 daughters because his first 7 and 3 were alive to God. So he only got 7 sons Again, double and three daughters and receive the double blessing of the Lord. So in conclusion, let me tell you this. When you see people crying, cry with them. Don't be like the three friends, even less like Elihu. Let us learn to live our lives out of brokenness before God. Remember the words of Job. Now I repent. Now I repent. One thing that I, that I noticed that before when I was attending some conferences, uh, we were all speaking in indicatives and in imperatives. More prayer, more Bible study, more evangelism. And now the latest years I hear more messages of being broken. But well, God dealt with me in my brokenness. But you see, we still do prayer, we still do evangelism, we still do reading of the Bible. But we understand that we are broken before our God. In a need of repentance, of asking forgiveness. And then when we deal with others, out of our brokenness we look at them. And we understand that they are also going through a life situation. And they need God in that situation just as I need God in my situation. And God hears our whys and our cries and our tears. And he does lead us through those valleys of suffering. Because he wants us to come to the situation that we understand that He loves us much more than our comfort. He loves me much more. That it's better for me to be broken in Him Amen. than to live some kind of fake Amen. faith. Amen. Let us pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You also show Yourself mighty and wonderful in our brokenness. We thank You that we can live with you even when we have all of our questions and whys and cries and when we don't see any answer but thank you that you are there with us and thank you that you listen to our whys and cry with us in our cries thank you that you have experienced it all so that you can show us the way and help us that we come to the point that in repentance we come before you and we express our need of you whether we feel good whether we feel terrible we are always in need of you we thank you and we praise you and we love you amen, amen.